Hey everyone, we're back for another episode of Ask GN. As always, there are a lot of good questions last week. We won't be getting to all of them, but if you have questions that weren't asked or were asked and we skipped, post them below and I'll try and hit it for the next episode. Uh, getting started here, first off, the question of note from the, uh, the first viewer is about AMD and their new RX series. So this is actually pretty topical right now. Don Joe says, hey Steve, AMD said in their RX 480 presentation that Polaris 10 slash 11 will feature cards with the price range of $100 to $300. Since the RX 480 is $199 to $230, do you think the $300 card is the 490? Uh, do you think it can challenge GT GTX 1070 or could it possibly be better? Uh, so first of all, just because the range is 100 to 300, I, I don't think that means there has to be a $300 card. Now that's not saying there isn't or won't be one, uh, but I think that's playing to the marketing language of uh, we're making something that's 230 or $250 and trying to keep it at a cleaner number. Now that said, the 490 certainly could exist. I don't have any inclination what it would be right now from any official sources. I'm sure there's rumors out there. I try not to, to buy into those too much uh, because one, if the rumors are accurate and legitimate, it means that they've been leaked past NDAs and that's bad for everybody. Uh, or two, they're complete BS and made up. So I don't know anything about the 490. Uh, if it does exist, I, I really, there, I have no good speculation for you uh, about the $300 range. Now that said, uh, I do think that part of the, the $300 number is just to include the eight gigabyte model, the RX 480. Uh, note that maybe this is something useful for you. Uh, Polaris is not meant to be a high-end competitor. And is not trying to release a Halo product, which basically means a flagship product. With Polaris, they're reserving that for Vega or Vega. Uh, and Polaris is really just targeting power efficiency and affordability. That's all they're going for with this one. Uh, they are targeting laptops, as you'll see in our recent news video we did from the E3 announcement. But uh, none of these things are really getting heavily pushed towards a, a Fury X equivalent or a 490X or 390X equivalents or anything like that. So I would not expect a high-end GPU to ship with Polaris or a big Polaris chip to exist. It just, it's not what they've built the architecture for. And we'll have more information for you that on that uh, as the review embargoes lift, I'm sure. Next question is Charlie Waffles, uh, who says, not sure if this has been asked before, but how likely are these closed loop Corsair water coolers to, to leak? What's their average lifespan? So. Uh, the, first of all, liquid coolers, we did a video about this. You can search the channel for uh, who makes your liquid coolers, I think. So liquid coolers, the ones by Corsair, by NZXT, Thermal Take, in almost every single instance, the actual maker of the liquid cooler is someone like Acetech or Coolit, Cool IT, uh, or SwiftTech or someone like that, Aqua Tuning. Um, so those are the actual suppliers of the liquid. That means that Corsair and NZXT, for instance, actually use the same supplier and the same model and the same unit uh, all the way down to almost everything except for tube length for the most part in some of their liquid cooling products. So uh, what I'm saying here for Corsair and their, some, of, some of their product line will apply to other folks who use the same supplier. The one that I know off the top of my head is Acetech. Acetech's liquid coolers that Corsair uses and that NZXT uses, currently anyway, are rated for about five years of use uh, or five years of existence anyway. I'm not sure how they do if you were to buy one and keep it on a shelf for five years. But five years of use, certainly. After that point, it's actually, it's not leakage that you're worried about. The, the question here very specifically says, do they leak or how likely are they to leak? It's not that they start leaking or they shouldn't anyway. Uh, if they do, then you need to, to keep call on the warranty. What happens is the liquid actually starts sort of permeating the tubes, depending on that there's different types of tubes. So there's uh, some tubes that are more rigid and plasticky, like the ones used on the Fury X. Uh, there's tubes that are more rubbery, like the ones that Acetec uses and a lot of their active coolers that are out there. And so depending on that material, there's a different type of, uh, we'll call it um, entropy of the liquid, just for sake of ease. So in the case of these rubber tubes, what'll generally happen is over the period of five years, 
the liquid will start permeating that rubber or that material. And so now you've introduced some air to the system. Uh, the pump has to work harder to push the same amount of liquid. It'll be less efficient at cooling. There's less liquid, so that means that uh, there, it generally will have a higher temperature. The liquid temperature itself will be higher. That means your components get warmer. So you can keep an eye on the component temperature, and that'll give you a good indication of lifespan. But uh, the answer is about five years for liquids. So if you're building something that you want to kind of put in a closet and access in 10 years, I would suggest an air cooler just because those don't really fail. And the fans, if you put it away, uh, the bearings will probably still be fine. So that's hopefully that answers most of that. There's plenty more to it, but uh, that's, that's the basics. Next question, I'm going to keep this one short, is from Cyborg1994 who asks, how accurate is PC part picker's watt amount on a part list? How close to the watt amount can I get away with? I, I actually don't use PC part picker uh, because I you know, don't need to. Um, but I will say, uh, I, I can't comment on how accurate their watt reading is, but generally what you can do, and this is the best way to stay up to date on this stuff, is look at reviews of really just the GPU and the CPU that you're planning to buy. The rest of the components are pretty inconsequential with their watt draw. Look at those two components specifically and find reviews where they've done power testing. We do power tests in almost every review we, we publish now, and that will give you an idea for total system power draw when using that component. And then you can look at delta values. So you can look at device A versus device B. So for example, GTX 1070 versus a 1080, which I'm only using because they just came out. And you can see the delta between those is maybe, I think in our test it was, uh, off the top of my head, it was something like 30 watts, which is about right. Um, so you see a 30 watt difference. That'll help you figure out if you need more wattage in your power supply. Now, to answer the question, well, uh, also actually just a quick throw on, we did a big how many watts do you actually need article. It's pretty long. It's got a lot of specific systems and component configurations tested. So you can find out how many watts you do need in that article uh, and then kind of extrapolate from there based on your components because I'm sure we didn't pick the exact thing that you're building. Uh, but that said, how close can you get away with in terms of the actual wattage amount Generally, you will actually almost always, you'll be at peak efficiency with the power supply at 50% load. So if your load is 500 watts, uh, you'll want something like a thousand watt power supply to be at peak efficiency, but that might be a peak load scenario. So how often will you actually be at 500 watts? And the answer is normally not very often. So uh, for things like gaming, you'll tend to be at a slightly lower than, uh, than the total system power consumption possible just because gaming isn't the most intensive thing that can happen. If you were to do something like um, transcode a video and transcode or compile software or something like that simultaneously, you'd basically be at 100% load in such an instance. And if you're doing that regularly, you would want to account for that in your power supply selection. But uh, generally, 50% will keep you towards the peak efficiency of the power supply. You can certainly push higher than that. I tend to saturate my power supplies at 80% when under peak load, but I also know that my system is almost never under peak load. Uh, so for normal use, I'm sitting at 50% or less for idle. Um, and the closer you push to that 100% capacity, the more likely you are to have things like voltage droop or excessive heat that causes death of the power supply or other components. Capacitors can blow, things like that. Uh, but that should hopefully give you a, a basic guideline. Check out our article, the how many watts do you need article. That'll give you more information. Next question is, uh, we've got a couple here. Nacho Chips says, question, I'm looking to buy a CPU cooler and ditch my stock Intel cooler. I want to test the temps on stock and then on the aftermarket cooler. Which stress test program do you suggest? So this is benchmarking, this is what we do. Uh, there's a couple of them. Prime 95 is really good, but I know there were some issues with Skylake. Uh, I have not seen them lately. I don't know if they were completely resolved by the microcode update that Intel pushed, but Prime 95 with the large FFTs, you'll see it pop up and ask you what to use. You use large FFTs, that will load the CPU almost exclusively, and that'll put it under enough load to generate heat and, uh, and create your high heat scenario. Then for measuring, you can use ADA64 free edition, uh, you can use the $20 engineer edition, you can use SpeedFan, mostly accurate, 
and uh, hardware monitor plus. Those are all options for monitoring the temperature. If Prime 95 isn't working for you because of some reason, microcode or whatever, you could also use 3D Mark and just kind of run it at a really high setting and put it on the CPU test, the physics test. Uh, that will load the CPU almost exclusively and that would be a good generation of sort of a more semi-real world but still synthetic load for, uh, for temperature testing. There are other options as well, but those are the two I would look at for basic testing. Next question, Colton Parker, can you explain UEFI and Legacy? I installed a new hard drive in my system and there was a problem with it. So I went on forums and a bunch of people said enable or disable UEFI or Legacy. So first of all, uh, Legacy refers to BIOS, basic input out sy output system. UEFI usurped BIOS. BIOS is really, when people say the, the combined term UEFI BIOS, it's kind of uh, leftover from ages past. There is no really more BIOS the way it used to be. It's all UEFI now. UEFI is uh, some kind of ex extensible interface basically. It's a type of firmware that can more directly communicate with your, app, your OS layer. So UEFI is capable of talking to Windows where BIOS could not. And that's where you get programs like uh, AI suite or something like that where you can tune the CPU from within Windows. That wasn't possible with just BIOS. So that's the difference between them in that regard. And the regard that you're asking, which is boot order, uh, I have a couple notes here just kind of make sure I address every key point quickly. Uh, so first of all, BIOS legacy after post, which is the power on self test, that's when all the devices are enumerated in post and tells you what's working and what's not uh, and does error beeps if there is an error. After post, the legacy version will check each device in the boot order in order that you've configured and see which devices are bootable and which have an MBR present, uh, master boot record. The master boot record has a lot of limitations. One is that the maximum capacity is, uh, is two terabytes for a partition. So you don't want that if you're using larger drives, which a lot of people are now. Another issue is uh, UEFI can have multiple bootloaders. So if you've ever seen a screen pop up, Windows 8 onward, that says you have multiple Windows installations, which do you want to boot to? That happens because of UEFI, which uses uh, the GPT, uh, which is a GUID partition table rather than MBR, master boot record. So it enumerates multiple OSs a lot cleaner makes it easier to do multi-installs and boots. Uh, generally, you will want to install every new system with UEFI mode selected first. Do that before you install your OS. If you've already installed your OS, you need to select the one that it was configured with, otherwise it just won't work because the MBR versus GPT uh, disparity between them. So I think that answers that. The last question for today, there's a couple others I, I do want to address, but we'll do it next time. Last question for today. <laughs> You kept flashing that big red button. This is from the last video. What should I have done with it again? So if you've already forgotten, please subscribe if you like this content. Thank you for watching. Patreon link to post for a video to help us out directly. I'll see you all next time.